Uh, so welcome. Our speaker today is Gabriella Coleman. She is the Wolf Chair in Scientific and Technological Literacy at McGill. And uh, she studies uh, geek culture. And she's trained as an anthropologist. And I think this talk is going to be really interesting. Uh, she has a new book out called Coding Freedom. And if you go to her website at GabriellaColeman.org, you can download it for free. So exciting. OK, so let's welcome our speaker. Thank you, um, Ian, for the introduction and especially the invitation. Um, I'm just going to dive right in, because I think I have a little bit too much to say. And in fact, um, if I were a cat, that would be me, because I'm in between two projects. I just uh, completed kind of a 10-year project on open source culture, ethics, and that was what my book is about. And I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, and then on the other side of that saying, which is anonymous. Um, and one of the things uh, that really struck me when I was at DEF CON uh, 20 this summer, which is a large hacker conference, was actually something that was written in the program. And I'm going to quote it, uh, which will help frame the talk. Um, but I think I actually bit off too much of this invisible sandwich uh, for this talk. So I might uh, have to shorten it in some interesting ways, but we'll get there when we get there. All right, so what was it in this uh, program that really struck out? And it was this. Uh, in the program, it said, the story of how ordinary hackers tilted the paradigm of technology and power ever so slightly closer to the little guy is important, maybe one of the most important stories of our time. And as someone who has thrown herself into open source uh, culture and hacking and anonymous, and who also teaches a more general course on the culture and politics of hacking, this struck me as quite true. And what I like about this quote is the fact that, first of all, it, it's not really hyperbolic. It's like it's tilted the paradigm of technology and power ever so slightly, right? This is not about like massive revolution, uh, but it's had an effect. And it is, I think, a really important story. So what I want to do today is talk about weapons of, of the geek, um, who you can, you, know, you can always identify a hacker by the stickers they have on their computers. And I've come up with kind of 10 propositions, attributes, that help us understand the distinctive nature of weapons of, of the geek. Unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to get through all 10 of them today, but I hope to get uh, to about seven of, seven of them. And I'm drawing primarily on, again, my work from free software and then my work on anonymous. Now, who here knows what free software is or uses it? OK, so most everyone. Just very, very briefly for the few people in here who may not know what free software is. Free software is basically software that has been licensed with an alternative set of licenses. Often they're referred to as copyleft licenses, which in distinction to copyright, which kind of uh, commands restriction over how you can, how others can, can copy and share your work, free software mandates you to kind of share your work. And basically, source code, the underlying directions of software when licensed under free software, allow anyone to access, modify, and circulate the software. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's the kind of gist of it. And in my book, uh, what I was interested in was the ways in which these free software developers have come to see source code as a form of in the context of the United States, First Amendment speech and free speech. It's a really complicated, uh, interesting story, which I'm not going to go into today. But that was the bulk of my research on free software. And as you can see here, this was a protest um, back in 2002, I think, um, where a programmer, Dmitry Skilarov, uh, was arrested when he left DEF CON, again, this big hacker conference for writing a piece of software that under an American act, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, was illegal. And it was a really important moment in my research. I'm here on the corner where I sort of realized at this very protest uh, that, wow, this association between code and speech was quite new. Uh, and that's what helped um, frame my research. So that's just you know very, very basics about free software. It's a fascinating world where there's these very complex free software projects uh, where um, 
uh, developers have come to really, really articulate a very, very strong ethics to free software that's wedded in the law. That's all I'm going to say about free software. Some other attributes will become more clear um, during the course of my research. Now, the other side of that sandwich is anonymous. And anonymous, who here has heard of anonymous? OK, so everyone. Um, you know, the mask is everywhere. I've seen it in the oddest places, in bathroom stalls in a beach town in New Zealand. People send me pictures from all over the world. The mask has really, really um, circulated. But one of the things about Anonymous, uh, actually in contrast to the world of free software, is that it's really hard to understand this world. They, they configure themselves in such a way uh, to, to um, create a lot of mystery, deliberate mystery. And then, of course, there's some illegal action that happens. So this is not a world about access and transparency like free software is. So what I want to do very briefly is just give a bit of a timeline for how Anonymous came into being, uh, because I find that even people who know about Anonymous tend not to know some of these details. And that will then help when I go through the 10, which will really be seven attributes of weapons of the geek. All right. So 2003 and 2008 is when the idea of capital A Anonymous was born. Um, and it was born on the image board 4chan, which is a you know, very notorious image board for its uh, very offensive and humorous content. And the name Anonymous both refers to the fact that everyone posts anonymously on 4chan. And anonymity as a kind of concept is taken very, very seriously. But the name started to be used, and no one knows exactly when, but roughly in this period, to troll. Um, that's troll face. And anonymous, you know, engage in really massive acts of coordinated trolling, pranking, uh, harassment, where a target would be chosen, and uh, they would be humiliated and harassed. And there was many different acts of trolling done under the name of anonymous. And it was something that unless you were really involved in, in kind of geeky circles, you probably didn't hear about until 2008. And 2008 was when Anonymous became more than simply a name used to coordinate trolling. It became a name to coordinate activist interventions. But the way in which this happened was that it happened through an act of trolling. And here, this is probably something that most people know about. But there was a video uh, of Tom Cruise that was an internal recruitment video of the Church of Scientology. And it was leaked on the internet. And it went viral very quickly. And Scientology you know, is known to be litigious. And so they were threatening web publishers such as Gawker with lawsuits if they did not take down the video. So Anonymous uh, went into like high trolling mode against the Church of Scientology. They thought this would be a really funny thing to do. Um, and by all like very precise estimates, it was the mothership of, of their trolling. So they pranked the Dianetics hotline. They sent countless pizzas to you know, every church in the country. Uh, they sent faxes of nude body images to the churches, and so on and so forth. And as part of their trolling campaign, um, they released a video. Who here has seen this video? OK, so not a lot of people. This is why I like to go through this. This video is really kind of amazing. And I'm not playing it. I recommend uh, you know, when you leave, if you're interested, to hear it. But this video declares a, a war against the Church of Scientology. And it was done by Anonymous. And it was a, a declaration that was done entirely as a joke. It was done for the lulls, L-U-L-Z, a kind of uh, internet jargon for the laughs. And, uh, it was, it was really funny, actually, the video. And it circulated also quite widely. And one of the fascinating things was that it, it prompted a debate among people within Anonymous. And they're like, huh, maybe we should really actually earnestly protest the church, not just troll them. And they had a big debate. And a lot of people were like, no way. We're like internet motherfuckers who just troll. Like, this is not what we do. And others were like, no, no, Scientology is like a creepy religion. Um, they're all about censorship. We want to fight censorship. And so through this debate, they decided to call a day of protests on February 10, 2008, whose, whose success would be very uncertain. 
they're like, we're not even sure anyone's going to show up, right? But lo and behold, in over 127 cities, uh, over 7,000 people showed up on the streets in front of um, Scientology churches. You know, the internet shows up and they protest the church. And it was one of these very interesting moments because on the one hand, they were still kind of acting like internet jerks and made sure that there was lots of lulls, you know, laughs at the protest. On the other hand, there was a kind of serious sensibility. And this is where I kind of jumped into the mix for reasons I won't get into. Um, but what was fascinating was that this activist sensibility was born from one of the, like, seemingly apolitical, trolling can be political in its own way, but seemingly apolitical activities. After this period, first of all, this project against the Church of Scientology to protest earnestly was called Project Chinology. And what then happened between 2008 and 2010 was that Chinology continued. Every month there'd be protests. They were kind of irreverent activists, but they were activists. There was still ongoing trolling coming out of 4chan, using the name Anonymous. And then new networks were using the name Anonymous to engage in activist action, very direct action. And the one that became most famous was Anonops. And they became very famous because they started to use the distributed denial of service attack, initially against uh, folks like the Movie Picture Association of America, to um, protest excessive copyright policies. But a new network was born separate from Chinology that started to engage in political action. And I was like, whoa, what's going on here? There's like new nodes growing using this name, similar iconography, different political cultures in the networks. Anonymous really busts into the public scene in December 2010 when you know, WikiLeaks releases a bunch of cables, uh, companies like PayPal, Visa, MasterCard, bow down to kind of probably governmental pressure and like we're not going to accept services. And then one of the biggest DDoS uh, operations of all time happened at the helm of Anonymous. And while botnets were used, um, zombie computers to you know, flood websites with too much traffic, individuals downloaded a program as well to contribute to that event. And that really opened the flood floodgates. And you know, my year, 2011, was completely dedicated to the study of Anonymous, where there was operation after operation after operation in all sorts of different places, from Tunisia to Egypt to operations against private security companies, uh, such as H.B. Gary, who were doing seemingly shady activities. Now, what was really interesting was that in the news, this was referred to anonymous as hackers. But actually, up to this point, well, hackers had certainly been important because they set up infrastructure or perhaps um, were the ones running botnets. In fact, so many participants were not hackers. But something happened. And that something was this accidental hacking of this security company called HB Gary. Uh, some very damning pieces of information were released to the world. Uh, including the fact that perhaps a security company was going to target journalists such as Glenn Greenwald and try to ruin their reputations because they supported WikiLeaks. And this inspired a group of um, hackers within Anonymous to kind of break away. And they created a group called Lull Security. And they went on a 50-day hacking spree in May. And it was really pretty unbelievable. And they were doing it for political reasons. They were doing it for the lulls. They were doing it to show that like, sorry state of internet security. Um, and then they kind of uh, uh, they disbanded. And a new group by the name of Antisec took its place. And Antisec was a very kind of militant political group. All during this time period, Anonymous is still engaging in other operations, but they're kind of working as a standalone group. Um, now, I want to uh, focus on 2012, um, which should be, oops, that slide, and just focus on two events, one of which was um, there was this one protest in 2012 uh, when there was big protests in Poland against the anti-counterfeit trade agreements. And these Polish parliamentarians put on the Guy Fox mask as part of their protest. And they're like, we will get media attention doing so. And indeed, they did. 
Uh, and that also just points to the fact how anonymous, along with operations like DDoS attacks, are really good at getting media attention. Um, and the other thing that happened in 2012 was uh, this fellow on the right, Sabu, who was a key hacker in LulzSec and Antisec, was revealed to be an informant, an FBI informant. And he had been arrested and threatened with 127 years in jail and to take away his kids. So he became an informant. And one of the results of that was Jeremy Hammond was one of these hackers in Antisec a kind of militant anti-capitalist, was arrested and is currently in jail. And this was a big, like, oh my gosh, everyone's really upset and anonymous. Um, and it also made the hacker groups kind of recede a little bit and work even more secretively as well. But this was, you know, as you can imagine, sort of big, big drama. Um, today, just very, very briefly, where is anonymous today? There's still hacking operations. There's still sort of um, a lot of operations that are not hacking based. There's multiple networks in existence. And just to give you a sense of the breadth of the types of work that they do, I just want to emphasize two actions, one of which is an operation in a small town in Ohio uh, focusing in on a, a, an alleged rape case that was reported about in the New York Times. Um, and people within Anonymous felt like there wasn't really enough attention being placed on this event and did all sorts of interesting things like um, mine for existing uh, videos and images that uh, were recorded on the night of, of the alleged rape uh, and recirculated it and basically brought massive attention to this is issue. Um, to the point where all sorts of people are like, yeah, I was also assaulted, and so on and so forth. And again, this isn't technically hacking. Uh, it's a really good kind of publicity campaign. Um, in the last few days, Anonymous have uh, hacked into various government websites in honor of Aaron Schwartz, who is a hacker who recently committed suicide. Um, and so it just comes to show that hacking is still one of the, one of the tactics. All right, so that's a little bit of an overview that I decided to give just because uh, I tend to find that uh, it helps to be on the same page. And now I'm going to go to some of these attributes that help us understand weapons of the geek, the nature of geek and hacker politics, which I actually do sincerely believe are becoming more important. And we're just kind of getting started with it. All right, so some of you are like, well, what do you mean by hacker? What are hackers? I've kind of ignored that question. And so this is um, the time where I kind of help to define it. And it's, it's hard to define because on the one hand, you know, you can have a simple definition. There are uh, computer aficionados obsessed with, with computing, whether software or hardware, who often self-identify as hackers. They go to hacker conferences. They wear hacker shirts, right? But once you start kind of working with hackers, whether it's open source or crypto folks or you know, hanging out with a more transgressive underground tradition, you're like, wow, there's a lot of differences among hackers. And they're very sectarian. They like to debate um, themselves as to what it means to be a hacker, what's appropriate. And so generally, in the kind of uh, journalistic and, and social science study of hackers, people will often refer to hackers having the hacker ethic. And there's this wonderful book by Stephen Levy um, where he talks about uh, hackers that were born in MIT in the computer science department, and he identified the hacker ethic, which was based on commitments to meritocracy, transparency, access. And while this is generally true, once you look at kind of um, hackers and their full variability, you start to learn, well, some hackers, like the Debian hackers who I studied as part of my free software project, were really into transparency and access, right? But the hacker underground, those that may be engaging in illegal activity but not necessarily criminal activity, well, transparency isn't always part of the game, right, when you're breaking the law. And so they tend to operate in secrecy. And so there's many different ways to understand what a hacker is, depending on the types of activities and different places that they're uh, interacting. I'm not going to go into like the full detail, but um, something I've seen a little bit more recently um, among hackers is a way to distinguish uh, the different forms of hacking is, are you a builder or are you a breaker? And so builders are often you know, associated with free software, 
where you might be building an operating system. Uh, breakers are, are people more focused in on security who are thinking about, well, how do I break into a system to, to better secure it, right? And there's obviously overlap, but there are differences both in mindset and cultures and in conferences between uh, these sorts of hackers. Aside from the differences in just practical activity, I am really quite interested in the ways in which hackers, and this goes back to the sectarianism, debate what is appropriate when it comes to the politics of hacking. And they debate it quite a bit. So when Anonymous engaged in that big DDoS attack with PayPal, Visa, MasterCard, whoosh, the hacker world was awash in controversy as to whether that was appropriate inappropriate or just plain childish, right? So Richard Stallman, who was the kind of founder of the idea of free software, wrote an op-ed for The Guardian who was in support of this action. Um, other hackers that I talked to were like, you know what, it's just simply lame. And other hackers, such as um, one from the Cult of the Dead Cow, was like, actually, DDoS is a problem because it takes away people's right to speak freely. It's a violation of free speech. So the point really ab ab about this first attribute is that first of all, there's many different ways to engage in hacking technically. And there's this kind of deep sectarianism, which can be quite productive in so far as people are debating what is appropriate and inappropriate uh, politically. Now, sectarianism might imply fragmentation. And there is a certain amount of, of fragmentation in the hacker world. But in order to understand you know, hackers and how they engage politically, you, know, you have to understand what they do. And I think an element that unites almost all types of hackers is that they are based in craftsmanship. And this is something that I explore quite uh, deeply in my book in relation to open source. And here I'll, I'll quote a sociologist um, who's written about craft quite a bit. And this is how he defines craftsmanship. Craftsmanship names an enduring basic human impulse, the desire to do a job well for its own sake. And I find this really interesting because what it means, and I've come across this quite a bit, is that while there's many differences uh, individually and then in these different kind of groups and entities among hackers, this craftsmanship also forms very, very strong bonds of fellowship. And one day I had a free software developer in my class who um, you know, is part of the Debian Free Software Project. And he was explaining to my students, you know, I often identify with other Debian developers who are from you know, Portugal or uh, Sweden far more than my fellow Canadian on the street. And I identify them in a very deep ethical and political sense. And I see this over and over again. And it's fascinating because what it allows for in certain um, areas of political and apolitical hacking is people can work together who have very different political sensibilities in the traditional sense. That is kind of not important because they're kind of united in their craft to provide better security, better privacy, and so on and so forth. But hacking is not simply just a craft, right? Um, and there's many crafts. All of the engineering's, you know, um, is are, are kind of have this craft logic. I think what I'm more interested in is the fact that hacking is a place where craft and craftiness converge. Uh, and this is something that I explore a little bit in the book, though I think I'll be given a little bit more treatment in my anonymous uh, material. So a third attribute to understand the nature of hacker politics has to do with craftiness and trickery. Now, uh, by craftiness, what do I mean, just in case it's not obvious? Because um, I have given this talk before where some people are like, I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, and I think a good way to you know, define it a little bit more specifically is to quote a hacker. And, and this is a, a breaker, not a builder. And it's a breaker who is constantly trying to circumvent uh, the rules that have been handed down to him technically. And this is how he described his craft, which in some ways is crafty as well, to my students. He says, you have to like have an innate understanding that it's arbitrary. It's an arbitrary mechanism that does something that's unnatural and therefore can be circumvented in all likelihood. And he was explaining this is how he treats all pieces of software so that he could find the vulnerability 
um, and then you know, create a good solution. And this is a mindset that's extremely disrespectful of all rules. And this is something that then seeps over into the political domain very often among hackers. This inclination to disrespect the rules doesn't mean that all hackers are going to be political by any means. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just saying that this is a habit of mind that then seeps over into the political world um, over and over again in the hacker world. And I'm going to give two examples of this kind of craftiness um, that are, come from free software and uh, anonymous. So copy left is, I think, one of these great examples where Richard Stallman, the founder of uh, the idea and concept of free software, but also the legal mechanism of free software, saw that um, you know, initially when he wanted to free software to the world, he actually didn't want to use a legal mechanism and didn't use the law initially. The law was the problem, in fact. But due to a series of very complicated controversies, he actually realized, no, we, we do need to use the law to do this. And he came up with a license uh, which used copyright and then disabled the restriction of copyright. And so by using copyright and disabusing it, I see that as a very crafty move. You know, I'll use a system and then disable it completely, right? And so that's kind of uh, what I mean by the craftiness. And he, he approached you know, the law as a hacker would, a kind of system that exists, it's imperfect, and I'm going to improve on it by uh, using it and abusing it in very interesting ways. Now, the other example is one more to do with tricksterism, uh, and it has to do with anonymous. Now, I've, I've often described Anonymous as tricksters, and I'm not going to go into massive detail about it, but you know, the more you read, like when you read about trickster literature and anthropology, you're like, wow, this maps onto Anonymous really well for all sorts of reasons. And I'm going to give you one interesting example. Now, anyone who reads um, trickster literature will see that every once in a while, tricksters get caught in their own trap. Um, they're trying to trick others, but then they got entrapped by their trick. And I can't help but think this Hello Leaders to Scientology video where Anonymous is trying you know, to be tricksters and, and troll and prank the Church of Scientology. They create this video, uh, which was a joke. But it was such a compelling trick that they themselves got trapped by their own trick. So this, to me, is one of the great examples of tricksterism to come out of this kind of geeky world where, lo and behold, they got trapped, moved forward with activism, but continued then to integrate their culture of trickery and humor into their political tactics as well. OK, on to my next attribute of what makes you know, hacker both ethics and politics interesting and vibrant. And this is actually one that's incredibly, incredibly important. Um, and it's free spaces. And it's something, uh, unfortunately, I didn't come across uh, until recently. So it's not in my book, though it should be in my book. And um, free spaces is a term that sociologists of social movements have come up with to capture particular dynamics, especially ethical dynamics, that arise when people come autonomously together to do something. Um, traditionally, um, free spaces, as analyzed by social movement literature, are, are the following. Things like co-ops, radical churches, women-only political spaces, independent bookshops, and transnational active, activist networks. And I'm going to provide a few definitions, more precise definitions, of what a free space is. But the point is that there are spaces that people feel are special in some way. They may not be inherently organized politically. They don't necessarily, they're not necessarily created to engage in politics. But what they do is create a space where under certain conditions, they become political havens of sort. And one of the fascinating things about hackers is they've got a lot of free spaces. And here are some of them. A uh, request for comments, I think, can be considered one because a free space doesn't have to be a physical space. So, request for comments, you know, was the procedure by which people came up with technical standards for the internet. The BBSs, bulletin board systems, and the internet relay chat. IRC is incredibly important for free software for anonymous. It's where I spend all my time. 
Uh, free Software Project is an institution, and these are institutions. There's membership policies, there's voting procedures, they, they are extremely complicated institutions. The Hack Lab and the Hack Space, which have proliferated, especially in the last decade, and things like the Hacker Conference or the Free Software Conference. So what it means is that while hackers tend to work you know, in corporations, in universities, they also have their own free spaces, which are apart. And these spaces are places where they you know, talk about their world, their ethics, and become really handy kind of resources for mobilizing political action under certain circumstances. And now I'll just provide two kind of handy quotes from sociologists who write about free spaces who give a very precise sense of what they are. They're havens that insulate the challenging group from the rationalizing ideologies normally disseminated by the society's dominant group. Another uh, definition is free space is free because we do relate apart, because we relate apart from our daily lives in them. Um, and again, really, really important to understand hacker ethics and politics, proliferation and abundance of these spaces. All right. Taking a bit of a turn, another kind of attribute to understand hacker politics has to do with the law. You cannot understand hackers independent of the law. They really go hand in hand. And now I'm going to quote one of my favorite, favorite uh, historians, uh, E.P. Thompson, who wrote about 18th century law and how important it was to English society. And I think this quote actually you know, could almost be transplanted to the hacker world with, with some modification. So this is the start of the quote. The law did not keep politely to a level, but was at every bloody level. It was imprecated within the mode of production and productive relations themselves, and it was simultaneously present in the philosophy of Locke. It intruded brusquely within alien categories, reappearing bewigged and gowned in the guise of ideology, it danced a cotillion with religion. It was an arm of politics, and politics was one of its arms. It was an academic discipline, subjected to the rigor of its own autonomous logic. It contributed to the definition of the self-identity of both rulers and of ruled. And above all, and this is really uh, important for the hacker world, it afforded an arena for class struggle, in the case of hackers, not necessarily class struggle, but struggle, certainly, within which alternative notions of law were fought out. And again, free software is really kind of an amazing domain as an anthropologist because to me it's not simply a place where you have all these technologists. It is the largest number of amateur legal thinkers in the entire world, I think. And one of the reasons why um, these developers are quite adept at the law is because they're kind of the skills, mental reasonings, um, and mental dispositions necessary to code and engage in technical activity is very similar to the law, which is a very rule-bound, rational system. So it's very easy for hackers to kind of approach it, learn it, and understand it. Now, two caveats. Does it mean that they like the law? No, not necessarily. It just means they don't get like super frustrated when dealing with it. Um, and it also doesn't mean that you know, they turn to the law always for legal solutions, but they have as well. And now there's a whole alternative body of law in free software thanks to these hackers. Now the law also enters the hacker world in uh, different ways, and this really pertains to anonymous, uh, and that's they're always getting into legal trouble, especially in the United States. And I, I kind of like this uh, infographic because it represents uh, the charges that Aaron Schwartz uh, was facing due to downloading a bunch of academic articles. There was 13 charges brought up against him under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is the law that tends to entrap most hackers, which is very uh, severe punishments and uh, is often you know, used in all sorts of scenarios because it's very broad and very vague. So whereas some hackers are reinventing the law, others are getting you know, entrapped by the law. So legal consciousness is everywhere part of the world of hacking. Now very closely related to this is that hackers foster a vibrant culture of civil liberties. Uh, this is the place where there are 
you know, thousands upon thousands of individuals across the world from Sydney to Sao Paulo uh, to here in Canada where people are talking about the importance of privacy, of fighting censorship, of ensuring free speech. And this is done in a legal sense, but it's done in a cultural sense as well. And in order to uphold, you know, strong legal culture of civil liberties, you need um, culture, or if you, need, if you want a strong legal kind of sensibility, you need a very strong cultural sensibility of, of civil liberties. I think this was put well by Cass Sunstein, a legal scholar who says, a well-functioning democracy has a culture of free speech, not simply legal protection of free speech. And again, this is everywhere uh, littered in the hacker and geek world. I'm going to give you a few examples, some which are very um, you know, mundane, uh, and others which are a little bit more dramatic. Um, and so on these uh, anonymous Twitter accounts are constantly you know, saying these dramatic things, <laughs> like in the dark ages they burn books, today they burn websites, and there's like all these retweets, and everyone's like, yeah. And so it's like, you know, this, this is what I mean by this active culture of civil liberties that is so strong in the hacker and geek world. And this is a mundane example. A more dramatic one, which I have in my book, is this wonderful, wonderful haiku. Yeah, really amazing, where uh, Seth Schoen, who at the time had to be anonymous, though not part of anonymous, um, he took, uh, there was a piece of software called DCSS which could decrypt DVDs, and it was illegal under the DMCA. And he wrote a very long haiku, which was once pleading to the judge, saying, you know what, judge, this is free speech. This is mathematics, this is poetry. And to show you, first I'm going to explain it to you, but then I'm going to actually take the software and write it out the code as a haiku. And that's what he did. It circulated. It was published in the Wall Street Journal. This is a prime example of the culture of civil liberties in operation among hackers. Now, I would say Anonymous also contributes to this when it comes to privacy in very profound ways. Um, and in some ways, it's a little bit depressing, actually, because one of the things about Anonymous is that they engage in operations that have to do with free speech, censorship, privacy. But as a cultural manifestation, they embody anonymity. And it's really interesting because Anonymous can be anything and everything. People have very different reactions to it depending on what they've seen, right? It kind of is a mass entity with many different meanings. But to me, as an anthropologist, what is distinctive about Anonymous is that they have come to life in the West just as privacy seems to be dying. Um, and so they're kind of performing its importance right when it's most threatened as well. And I think that this is also a really important part of that, um, you know, creating a kind of culture of civil liberties. Uh, unfortunately, I sometimes do think they're just, um, you know, the party at the funeral of privacy as well, the last gasp or something. Um, all right, so I'm going to just briefly say, and I'm not going to go into detail with free software, but I will give an example from uh, Anonymous. There is the most fascinating fusion of strong individualism and collectivism in, in hacker and geek worlds, uh, where the individual is, is really honored in a lot of ways, but there's an amazing amount of collectivism as well. And there's uh, a, quite a bit of a discussion about that in my book. In terms of anonymous, this comes out in very fascinating ways. So the individualism is very strong because anyone can take the name. And they really encourage that. And because of that, there's multiple networks in existence. Vox Anon, Anon Ops, Anon Set, Shinology. Uh, there's regional nodes in existence in India and in Romania, Brazil. Do what you want with it. You are an individual. You're free to do so. On the other hand, the most important ethic, ethic within Anonymous is not to seek individual public fame, recognition, or money for your actions. And this is a very, very strong internal ethic. Where people do this, they're chastised, they're sometimes uh, marginalized, they're even kicked out of the project. And, and myself, who acts as a kind of important broker of public knowledge, is sometimes reminded to, to make sure I act humbly in the face of Anonymous. And I think this is a great example of that really strong individualism and collectivism that exists. Um, but I'm going to skip over that. 
even though it's very interesting. Um, and I'm going to focus in on this. Uh, which is that a lot of hacker kind of domains are resistant to extreme commodification and also can poach co corporate resources. And I'll explain what I mean. I think um, by giving you a sense of what free software is, um, it, it, free software is so clever because it's a legal mechanism to make sure that the software can travel and it can be used by anyone, but it can't be closed off. And so it's really, uh, a wonderful mechanism to prevent uh, commodification. Anonymous is also really interesting, too, because one of the things it, that's fascinating is that they've taken symbols from popular culture and made it their own. So it's a kind of reverse uh, process. And so far, I haven't seen any kind of commercial entity uh, trying to you know, make a buck off Anonymous yet. And my theory is that they're too afraid of Anonymous. Like that they'll be hacked and DDoS and they'll find something nasty. So they're like, we're not going to even go there, right? But the part I'm actually interested in is this. I don't know totally what this is meant to signify, but I feel like it, it, it points to the fact that hackers are working in companies. We need them. There are system administrators. There are net administrators. There are programmers, right? So what this means is that there's going to be an economic system that generates the need for these types of individuals. And they, there's always going to be a small sl surplus of them who also decide to engage in political action as well. Um, and what's also interesting is that many hackers will take time at work to work on their activism as well. Um, and this actually isn't entirely unique to hacking. Um, there's a wonderful, wonderful book by a Harvard business professor who's an ethnographer who talks about gray zones. And he worked in factories. And he looked at the ways in which factory workers made stuff that wasn't related to work. But, but managers kind of decided that this was OK. It helped improve their skills. It kept them happy. You know, so it was a peaceful, coexistent relationship. So he says, gray zones are areas in which workers and supervisors together engage in officially forbidden yet tolerated practices at work. And I would say that you know, a lot of hackers I know who are involved in political action uh, exploit the fact that when their managers see this, uh, they think this. <laughs> um, and they can't really tell what's going on, you know, so that they could get away with you know, running a Debian um, server at work and, and so on and so forth, right? And so this is another fascinating, fascinating feature of just you know, hacker production in general that you know, if a PhD student wants to work on this, please come to me, because there's, there's a really interesting project. All right, um, to finish, because I want time for questions, the last um, element that I'm going to talk about has to do with the ways in which hacker politics propagates and calls attention to itself. Um, so that's number 10. And uh, now I'm going to reveal the source of my title, Weapons of the Geek. Does anyone know where that comes from? Weapons of the, of the Geek, what I'm referring to? OK. Um, it's a really, really famous anthropology book called Weapons of the Weak <laughs> by James Scott. And it's, he's like, uh, if you want to, like, you're like, wow, I think I like anthropology. He is a master craftsperson in anthropology. He's an amazing writer. And he was interested in peasant politics. And that's what uh, weapons of the weak are. And this is how he distills the nature of peasant politics, which could not be more different to weapons of the geek. OK, so this is weapons of the weak. He says, everyday forms of resistance make no headlines. There's rarely any dramatic confrontation, any moment that is particularly n newsworthy. And whenever the ship of the state runs aground on such a reef, attention is typically directed to the shipwreck itself and not the vast aggregation of petty acts that make it possible. Uh, it is only rarely that the perpetrators of these petty acts seek to call attention to themselves. Their safety lies in their anonymity, the nature of the acts themselves, and the self-interested muteness of the antagonist thus conspire to create a kind of complicitous silence that all but expunges everyday forms of resistance from the historical record. Two of my favorite, or I think it's one paragraph, my favorite paragraph in, in anthropological writing. Now, 
Uh, weapons of the Geek is not this. First of all, the actors tend not to be economically marginalized. Um, they call attention to themselves in very different ways. Anonymous is interesting because they're anonymous, but not anonymous in this way. And I'm going to now just emphasize two elements to Weapons of the Geek uh, having to do with how it propagates and call how it calls attention to himself. So now um, I'll quote Evan Moglen who uh, is, he's really a super geek lawyer who came up with the licenses around free software. And he wrote that practical revolution is based upon two things, proof of concept and running code. And he's explaining why free software took off the way it did, why it was so powerful. It wasn't simply someone, hey, I have an idea. Do you guys want to jump on board? It was, here's the law, here's the software, jump on board by, uh, both working on it, and then it became a template for others. And so free software inspired things like Creative Commons. Uh, scholarly access as a movement existed, but was given a big boost by the fact that there was an existing practice in place, right? Um, and again, kind of calling attention to itself in very interesting ways. Now, Anonymous is really interesting, because first of all, um, like, they don't make as much stuff, like software and, and things like that. And in fact, uh, in, in, in kind of uh, opposition to this, where you have like running code and proof of concept, Anonymous actually propagates so well uh, because, as they themselves say, it's an idea, you know? Um, and it's a powerful idea, but it's an idea that can be instantiated in very different ways in very different places. And the individuals, again, are taken out of the equation, which really helps in keeping it an idea as opposed to that um, social movement with uh, that leader or something like that. Definitely there's some characters that became identified with Anonymous, but I think it, it really works so well and so powerfully, precisely, because it is like this that we identify Anonymous with and not an, 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 not an individual. And it's also interesting, too, because I've been talking about hackers, but actually anonymous is this domain where hackers are extremely important in a lot of ways, but it is actually far more open to all sorts of people um, who can participate simply by you know, running a Twitter account, by photoshopping an image, by writing a manifesto. And so in some ways, it's far more open and participatory, participatory than many hacker domains, although I will say that many people involved are traveling companions to the hacker world, uh, kind of um, engaging in, in similar arenas and places, Reddit, 4chan. Um, and so there is a kind of shared cultural world, even though the technical skills are quite different. So those are some of the um, attributes that I think are interesting, um, that are you know, provisional, they're not exhaustive, that pertain to this world. And just as a final, final point, um, you know, I really do actually think, that's a beautiful sunset that I took <laughs> from the internet. I actually uh, you know, do think that we're not in the, um, oops. We're not in the golden age. We're actually we're in, in the dawn at some level of kind of geek and hacker politics. And so um, it's important to understand you know, these kind of formative years. And it'll be quite interesting and exciting to see what will become of weapons of the geek in the coming decade. So I'll leave it at that for now. And thank you very much. Okay. So you said that, that the idea behind anonymous is one that can be instantiated in different places in different ways. Um, would you say these attributes of the geek can can you map out different geographies? And the one I'm in particular curious about, I'm always struck by how much, in general. Um, um, Americans, on average, strike me as value and freedom of speech a little bit higher than Canadians do. So what do Canadian hackers look like by comparison, right. say? Now, that's a great question. It reminds me, I was just at a, a conference on hacktivism, and someone asked a hacker speaker that very question. And he's, oh, sorry. So uh, the question was about distinct geographies of hacking and whether you know, regional differences matter and how they matter. Um, 
And you know, the short answer is like absolutely they do in very, 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 very interesting ways. And even something like Debian, which is this thousand person project, which has its own culture, uh, you know, the Germans and the Americans will see things very differently. And depending who is a uh, Debian project leader, they will bring different issues to the table. But on the other hand, there is a way in which, um, you know, the person, there was a person answering this very question who is a hacker who works for the Citizen Lab uh, in University of Toronto, and he's Canadian, and he's like, I'm from the internet, you know? And um, on the one hand, you've got to be somewhat skeptical of that. On the other hand, I think that there's some truth to that. So there's a way in which certain values, I mean, I really, it really uh, stuck out when uh, India anonymous operations came into being. And in, in, in India, there was a couple of ISPs who were going to block uh, the Pirate Bay. And they were like, you know, you're um, screwing with our commitments to free speech. And they went into you know, DDoS mode and protest mode. And I do think that there's a way in which local values matter enormously. Uh, and just going to an American hacker conference versus a European one, that difference will be clear. But then there's a baseline of values, such as free speech and privacy, that kind of circulate globally as well. And their source may be originally American at some level, but um, they've kind of exceeded that, too. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you uh, distinguish, say, the free software movement from the open source movement? OK, yeah. Um, I think, so another really great book is by Chris Kelty. It's called Two Bits, um, The Cultural Significance of Free Software. And both he and I have tended to say, you know, at the level of practice, there's a lot of similarities in terms of how people collaborate and um, how they kind of view the importance of open source and free software. But at the same time, there are definitely differences, too, um, especially, especially as open source has become more common in the corporate sphere. Um, you know, there's definitely values that emerge there that wouldn't emerge in these free spaces of the free software projects, right? Um, so I think it just depends on what you're asking. At the level of licenses, they're like almost indistinguishable. There's like a few open source licenses that have like these very particular elements related to patents, but they're virtually the same. And that's what's kind of fascinating is that even if you are identified with free software, you can still work almost seamlessly with an open source developer. But the difference might be in that a free software developer might hit the streets, for example, when someone's arrested for writing a piece of software. But a lot of open source developers would also show up as well. you know. And in the end, I think it helps signal the fact that people have different motivations and inclinations to participate. But then at the level of, of practice, they're still able to do so quite seamlessly as well. There are moments, though, where that does become more important depending on something that someone does. you know. Um, so that's, I know that's not like a very pithy answer. It's more like, it just depends, you know? Um, and I do think one of the um, great points made by uh, someone who's now just finished a PhD in a social science but was a Debian developer, he once noted that people would say, oh yeah, open source, we, we use open source software because it's better software, because the method of openness is better. And he's like, well, that's actually wrong, because initially it was especially a huge pain in the ass to use a lot of this open source software. So he was like, it was, for me, this is why he uses free software foremost a political decision, but a lot of open source developers will not ever use the language of, of politics to conceptualize their work. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's one more. Yeah, I'm just wondering where a hacker would stand on uh, sharing, exchanging uh, information or free access to information. Because on the one hand, their trade depends on protecting knowledge, which is preventing others from figuring out how their hack works. Yet, here's a forum which freely disseminates uh, information pertaining to how hackers. So, 
Um, that's where that, that's in some ways why I started with the sectarianism at the beginning, is first of all, like, not all hackers are, are um, against intellectual property, you know? And there's this wonderful, wonderful, like, we would say poorly made, but it's wonderful, documentary from 1984 at uh, one of the first hacker conferences in Marin. Um, and the filmmaker was interviewing all sorts of people uh, who, who self-identified as hackers. And Richard Stallman was there, and he's like, you know, I get incredibly depressed to even think about the idea of uh, intellectual property. This is wrong. I need to have access to blueprints. Uh, Steve Wozniak was like, well, uh, I believe that we should share it as a community, but it's still important to have some property. And then another hacker was like, that is my soul. No one has a right to do anything with it. And so within the hacker world, there is variability, although there tends to be a tendency towards keeping information free and accessible. Again, for all sorts of different reasons, from that's you know, the way that knowledge can improve, that's how the craft can improve, to more uh, fine-grained arguments, such as you know, the ones that have popped up around uh, Aaron Schwartz's actions, where it's like, well, the public is paying for science um, and academic research, so the public has a right to these journal articles. But there's many different positions. All the while, there is a tendency towards uh, information freedom. But it's not, definitely not unitary uh, as well. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, so this has been a wonderful. Um, oh, I didn't repeat the question. I'll do it now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I hear like so, what are you saying. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this has been a wonderful um, entree to me into world. I honestly, I, like I didn't know what anonymous was. Um, but I was wondering for you. I mean, clearly it's a gendered uh, group. I, the, the mask I couldn't even wear plausibly. Right? I don't have a mustache. I've never had a mustache. Um, you're a woman who's studying them, and as you said, sort of like a, a part of the public dissemination of what they're doing. Do you sort of feel the genderedness of the, of the groups, and how do you ne negotiate that as an anthropologist? OK. Yeah, it's a great question, and it has to do with gender dynamics within the hacker world and how I, as a researcher, kind of um, you know, experience that. And, uh, and, it's, and it's interesting because I, I think I would have given you a different answer had I only done open source and had I not worked on anonymous, right? There's a funny kind of uh, interesting uh, element to the hacker world, which first of all, it can be very, it is very uh, actually male. <laughs> like there's more dudes than females. Like, you know, hands down, you can't really uh, question that. Uh, there are different regional cultures as well where, you know, I, I feel like in Europe uh, some of the sexism is not as strong. Uh, I feel like open source compared to InfoSec is very different with, with gender di dynamics. So there's a kind of uh, difference, but I don't want to just go there. There is this interesting thing where there can be a strong, I don't know if I want to call it a masculine inclination, but it, it can be of kind of elitism, uh, especially intellectual elitism. And people can be very strong with their words when it comes to those intellectual capabilities. Uh, and this is something that's even discussed among hackers as to what's appropriate and inappropriate, especially when it comes to new newcomers and females. Um, and that's definitely there. It's definitely, definitely there. On the other hand, it is a domain that is very accepting of difference. Uh, of disability difference, of um, people with uh, mental illnesses, of there's a lot of transgender uh, people, people who, who change their sex and it doesn't, you know, no one even blinks an eye. Um, and so I do think that on the one hand, there is a kind of strong masculine culture of elitism. On the other hand, there's one of the most accepting domains I've ever felt being among hackers. And those uh, coexist at the same time. Um, and also sociologically, sociologically in the last five years, there's been an explosion of discussion around gender and hacking, uh, which has yielded things from anti-harassment uh, statements for conferences to, for example, if someone had slides with a kind of semi-pornographic image, there'd be a huge discussion about it and would go up on the geek feminism wiki. So that's actually been very kind of positive. 
Um, in terms of what I do think needs, you know, there's, there needs, elements need to change within the world. I will say open source, I never felt any issue whatsoever. Anonymous has been a little bit different. You know, people have just been like, you know, will you marry me online? And like, you know, just, I'm like, what is going on here? And much more advanced, uh, you know, or forward in, in terms of their statements to me that never kind of happened in open source. And maybe it is the kind of, anonymity of it or something that I actually never meet these people that allows them to do that. But it's been much more present than open source. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm afraid we're out of time. Oh, okay. So let's thank Gabrielle again.